Good morning. Uh, I'm Richard Whitaker with the Austin Chronicle. Uh, it is my deep pleasure to be here. Uh, just a quick show of hands, who saw the film last night? Uh, it, it, for those of you that didn't, it is amazing. Uh, April 12th it comes out, you need to see this film. Uh, quick note before we start, uh, we will be taking audience questions. Uh, so go to the South by Southwest uh, Go app, uh, click the engage button and enter your questions and we'll get to those at the end. So now to the people you are actually here to see, the cast and creators of uh, Civil War. Uh, first of all, Wagner Morrow. <laughs> Kaylee Spaney. <laughs> Kirsten Dunst. And writer and director, Alex Garland. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Morning. So, how are you feeling after last night's screening? Uh, yeah, yeah. Still processing. <laughs> yeah. My, my family loved the movie. <clears throat> yeah, I feel great. My friends loved it. That's all that matters, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, Alex, there is a lot in this film. It's kind of a state of the nation. It's an observational thing about the nature of journalism, about the nature of combat, and the nature of, of divided societies. It's such a huge project. What made you think, this is the time to make this, apart from the fact that that's exactly what we're living through right now? Uh, well, you, you, you just answered it. Um, I, uh, every now and then... Um, I work on a film, uh, Ex Machina would be a good example, about AI, and in a funny kind of way, after the film has come out, people sometimes use the word prescient or predictive or something like that. And I always feel slightly embarrassed when people say that because um, at the time I wrote it, there was a huge debate happening about it. It just may, it may not have been in film at that point, or it, or it actually may have been. I think that all of the topics uh, in, in this film have been a part of a huge public debate for years and years and years. The, the debate's been growing and growing in volume and in awareness, but none of it is secret or unknown to almost anybody. You can't say everybody because that would uh, be too big a generalization, but very, very broadly, I felt everybody understands these terms and... Um, uh, I, at that point, I just felt compelled to write about it. Um, uh, if you cast your mind back to... So I wrote this in June four years ago, which was, bef you know, there was an election coming. We were just dealing with COVID. Um, uh, same, same conversation as now, identical. So uh, th th that's where it came from. I was wondering for the cast, like your, your first response when you read the script and you're taken you know, on this incredible path with these characters which feels so much like everything we're living. I was wondering about your responses at that first, at that first read. Uh, first of all, I thought it was uh, extraordinary writing. You know, it was one of the best scripts I've have ever had read. Uh, and then, uh, and then, yeah, I thought it was timely. I, th I, th I thought that the uh, polarization is a thing in the world, not only here in, in the US, but in, in my home country, in Brazil and, and everywhere. So uh, I was, and I hadn't met Alex before, we had met uh, for when he was casting Davs. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of, of Alex. I, I honestly think he's one of, the, one of the most brilliant people I have ever met. And uh, uh, and <laughs> he really is, and uh, 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 and I wanted to work with him. So it was all like a big, uh, you know. I was like, yeah, I I, I was really really rooting for it. Like I want to be in this film. Took took him like uh, some time to decide. <laughs> we had the, we had a Zoom call, and I thought I, I thought uh, it, this went well. <laughs> Because we were like really like having a conversations about things, and it was like, but I had the experience before of having great meetings with directors, and then you know it, it doesn't happen. Yeah. 
but um, fortunately for me, it, uh, yeah, it happened. So. That's so weird. First of all, um, if I'm so brilliant, I just think you don't get out much would be my <laughs> would, would be my thing. But um, I remember, yeah, we got on great, and then I called up the producers and said, "Yeah, it's him. Awesome." I thought it was like the next day. Well, took I, like you wanted it to be ten it minutes. It took or? it like f four days and twelve hours because uh. <laughs> I was really like, yeah. It took longer for me, Wagner. Yeah? Yeah, I was like waiting. I remember talking to Alex on a Zoom and I got in the car with my best friend. I was like, I really want to do this movie. I hope I get this movie. I, I feel like he's Zoomed with one other actress or something. But I was really hoping to get it. Well, we all want to work with you. Yeah, it worked out. <laughs> worked out great. And Kaylee, you, you've worked with uh, Alex before on, on Devs. So, so what was the process for you of coming on board? I, I just think that it, the thing that you're seeking out as an actor is to find collaborators that if, if you get so lucky to work with multiple times and to sort of have that shorthand and to have that trust, I think that's what you're always looking for. And the fact that it ended up being Alex, I just I just feel very lucky. And uh, I think we, we definitely had that and uh, we understood each other. So um, uh, yeah, it was a treat. Um. The core of the narrative is these four combat zone journalists of various stages in their life and career trying to get across America in the middle of, of a, an internal con uh, conflict. I was wondering about picking journalists because their role is so specific in, in a combat zone. They are the observers. There's a, a great line um, from uh, you, Kirsten, of... Uh, we record uh, so others can ask. And it, it, it sums up the film so beautifully. I was, but I was wondering about coming to having the, the people going through this world being journalists. I mean, for me, the, the documentary that Alex showed us, the Maria Colvin documentary, Under the Wire, was what really w was the most powerful thing in terms of reading and seeing things. Uh, we also watched Come and See, which was a movie that I had never seen before that really shows a journey of a young person and what happens to them as, as the course of a war unfolds. Um, but really, I mean, for me, it was about getting a camera in my hand as soon as possible, so I looked like it wasn't, you know, that it was second nature to me. So that, that was the most, the, the, the quickest thing for me is not looking like I hadn't had this in my hand for years and years. Well, I, I, I personally think that uh, uh, the I think journalism is a very important thing for democracy, and uh, uh, and I, I myself, I'm a journalist. Uh, I, I graduated as a journalist, and I've I've played the journalist before, and uh, especially. I think that especially in this polarized uh, moment, you know, also with uh, people like getting information from their own bubbles and 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 this and getting informed through social media and all that and all the fake news and uh, all that, I think journalism is a crazy important uh, institution for democracy. Uh, so I'm I w I'm I'm always. One of the things that make me really proud of having done this film is just to portray, uh, to, to, to play a journalist. And uh, but we we were doing. I I I I can't reinforce that like more. War journalism is a completely different thing. Uh, and uh, and like like Kirsten uh, uh, said, um, we have to have every time I see an image or a video from a war zone, I go like, there's no reason, there's no explanation, in my opinion, no reason explains war. No reason explains the human cost of a war. And I think that the, the, the empathy that the, that the work of journalists brings uh, to us is, uh, is, is essential, is fundamental. One of the really interesting things about the script, Alex, is that you you dive in at the tail end of the war, and 
you deliberately leave a lot of questions unanswered. Uh, and I was talking about that, about the decision to come in right at the end and say, this is, this is you know, at, at one point, uh, one of the characters said that, you know, this is the race to Berlin. And I, I you know, that, this sets up such a fascinating structure. I, I, I think that's a question about what constitutes an answered question. Um, I, I personally think questions are answered. There's a lot of things that are clearly answered. One is there is a fascist, corrupt president who's smashing the constitution, attacking their own citizens. And, and that is a very clear answered statement. And if you want to think about why Texas and California might be allied and putting aside their political differences, the answer would be implicit in that. So I think answers are there, questions are raised, answers are there, but you have to, to step to it and not expect to be spoon-fed these things. It makes assumptions on the part of the audience. Um, I understand not all films do that, and a lot of people do want to be spoon-fed, but um, film is a broad church, and there's lots of different ways of making films, and, and some place more of an emphasis on the audience than others, and I'm, I sit in the pew that is trying to involve themselves in a conversation with the audience and not lecture the audience. Um, but I think, I think the material personally is there. It's there by inference and implication. Um, did that fail to answer the question? Oh, no. That, I think that's the thing. You know, you, it, this is a movie that trusts the audience. It trusts the audience. It does. Uh, and it's not that every film has to do it. Um, uh, but I like films that trust the audience. The, the film I saw this year, it, Anatomy of a Fall, gave me this enormous sense of relief as I was watching it. Um, I really think it's a wonderful, wonderful film, but uh, I, I so appreciated that it was not giving me an answer in the way that many films would itch to do. She did this or she didn't do it. It relied on me as a grown-up to be able to think about the arguments and, and step into these wonderfully performed and intelligent conversations within this family and legal structure. And I thought, thank fucking God. Like, thank fucking God. Yeah, because actually I am a grown-up. I am. And, and I also know that uh, I, I talk to people and it just finds out, you know, they're grown-ups too. And so we're, we're sort of able to do this. You know, it's, it's, it's not beyond us. It's, you know. And part of the unspoken, the, the, the implicit, is the, the dynamic between the characters that you have Lee and Joel, who are clearly an established team together and, and have this dynamic together. You have you know, Sammy, played by Stephen, who is just wonderful uh, in this film, is kind of the, the old war dog who just can't get out of, the com can't get out of it. Yeah. You know. um, uh, and then you have Jesse as kind of the, the newcomer, the, the kind of not-so-wide-eyed uh, young photographer who's really trying to, you know, thinks this is her future. But that's a fascinating dynamic because so often with these kind of scripts, you know, Jesse is going to be the character who comes in and she's going to be your POV character. But th this remains on, on, on Lee, on, on your character, Kirsten, as kind of the, the emotional core of it, having this, this younger version of herself on this come in. I feel like it's a true ensemble, you know? But I do feel like there is immediately meeting Kaylee's character, Jesse, we have an unspoken soul connection that's beyond, you know, what we're actually talking about on the surface. Um, I think I said to you actually, did I say to you? I think I did. In the lobby, I was like, what if I was your your mother in a past life and you were my daughter or something, right? Yeah. I said, like, just to give something that was a little bit under the surface, then, you know, you need Kevlar and, you know, it was just, it, but it just roots you in something a little bit more unconscious of when you meet somebody for the first time and you feel like you've known them your entire life. So that's, that's the, you know, you gotta put weight and life into these things. And I feel like our car and all of us together, we really, actually loved each other and had a really good time together. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned this at the, uh, the screening last night, the car. The four of you um, stuck in a car for a, a, a large portion of, of this film. Yes. How long, <laughs> with, was, how long with was, was the shoot, with... Alex? It was uh, 10 and a bit weeks. Yeah, we shot it chronologically. So those, 
especially for my character, because this, you know, I'm, I'm, you watch me meet them. That those relationships and bonds with all the characters happened in real time, and I, I think it really, hopefully, came across in the film. And Wagner, you're uh, you're experiencing driving. <laughs> yeah, I was a driver. <laughs> That's basically my 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 role. In the oh God. I said that you before. Yeah, I was I was now. praised many times by my driving uh, skills. But, it, but this is a gag. You, this is the same gag you did in the queue. Did you know? Night. Did you, you know yeah. I was a good driver before you? But, but is that? now it's a shtick. It's it's like it's not anyway. Yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I felt many times. Like a good driver? Like a good driver. Like yeah, I'm, and then, I'm, and then I'm, said, I'm, I'm making my driver. contribution to this film by being a good driver. But uh, Wagner's a very good driver. I once say, in the car with all the cameras, you weren't driving. There was a guy on the roof <laughs> controlling it. <laughs> Wait. Ouch. Wait, that's right, not it, entirely it's the magic true. magic of film. Sorry. The illusion gets lifted. No. <laughs> None of it's real. <laughs> there was a guy on the roof. I pretended very well that I was driving. But then there were many scenes that I was really driving. Please help me no, out. No, yes, there were. There were. And you, you drove were a so lot. good. That's what the scariest day is when. Yeah. Like, just keep likes the, the speed. Curb. Keep the speed. Be closer to the camera. There was a camera right here with another car. Yeah, don't go. Don't pass 20 miles per hour. You know, there's a lot of things. Acting and, and act. driving is hard. And then be. It's hard acting, dri driving and acting. <laughs> but, yeah, one anyways. Of the, one of the fascinating parts about the relationship between uh, Jesse and Lee is that Jesse has the photographer skills, and Lee sees this very, very early on. And a lot of what she's teaching her is it's in the lines about, you know, get Kevlar in a helmet. It's the situational awareness. And I think that's where you start to really get the insight into what war zone journalists are like and what it is that makes them different and in that ability to survive in those environments. You know, one person described it to me as uh, they're, the, they're the people who run towards the explosion rather than away from it. And I was, yeah, that's fascinating to me, Alex. And I was wondering about the research for that of, of building out those kind of details that are going to feel authentic to people who, who, know, th who know war zone journalists. Is that me? Yep. Oh, oh, well, uh, I, I, I've known a lot of war correspondents because um, I grew up with them. Uh, my dad worked on the newspaper, and so I was familiar with them. And uh, so there are, there are two, at least two component parts. I think there are many. One of them is very serious minded, uh, often incredibly courageous, um, very, very clear eyed about the role of journalism. Also, often, l like people who've served, like veterans, having to deal with very deep levels of disturbance and, uh, and having to constantly question themselves about why they do this and both, uh, both sort of being absorbed and repelled at the same time and what that does over time to people's psychology. Um, and so there was an attempt, different representations of that within the car. Uh, Stephen McKinley Henderson has processed all of this. He's made a kind of peace with it um, and understands what he is and what he needs to do. Um, uh, Kirsten and Wagner's characters are in the, the whirlwind and being knocked each way, trying to hold on to what they believe, but also being destroyed by it. And then trying to warn this younger journalist from from entering into that world, not not just for their physical safety, but also their psychological safety. So, so that that was the um, the spread within the car. So it, it was it was partly to present the importance of journalists, but also journalism and war uh, war journalism in this case, but also uh, the cost uh, and the complexity, I suppose. I think you know it's. It fascinated me because, you know... Oh, sorry, there's one other thing. Oh. Sorry. I, I'm born in 1970. The, the, the journalists I grew up with, uh, a lot of them were coming back from places like Vietnam and Cambodia. They were an older generation of war correspondent. And um, so one of the things I wanted to do was to take the journalism context and include a throwback to something much older, which is why the youngest journalist uses a uh, film stills camera 
that, that there's a that the visual grammar of that is the visual grammar of a 1970s era war correspondent photographer um, and I, I never know if these things land but it just sort of somewhere unconsciously draws a connection to something that goes a long way back that something I agree strongly what, with what Wagner said about journalism and the, the importance of it and something awful has happened with the way journalism is perceived um, and so this film is attempting to sort of stand in opposition to that. Um, uh, anyway, yeah. And another element of that is that, you know, Lee clearly has PTSD. And in combat environments, you know, there's so much discussion in America about veterans with PTSD. But there isn't discussion about journalists with PTSD or... Uh, you know, Red Cross medics or diplomats. I, mean, I have friends who were stationed in the Green Zone in um, in Iraq, and one of them told me, like, I left the day that they got a that somebody got a truck bomb through the gate. That was too much. And I said, Well, did the mortars not affect you? He said, No, no, I could sleep through mortars. But that, you know, he's still dealing with those issues. And this opens up, I think, this conversation about what journalists put themselves through and are expected to go back. And the sequence where Lee is just having flashbacks to all these incredible photos that are utterly traumatic moments that she's borne witness to. It's, it's such an important sequence. Yeah, what's the question? <laughs> well, that, sorry. That, that, sorry, about, about this, the opening up this discussion about, you know, about how, you know, the emotional and mental... I'm not going to lie. As an actor, it's very hard to speak on someone who has actually been through this. You know, I'm acting. I don't, I don't know what it's like to see children die in front of me. You know, so to, for me to speak on it feels not, I don't know, feels weird to me. Um, but I, you know, just did my best service to represent and take in emotionally how I could best relate to the situation. But one thing that I, th I think it's fascinating about these kind of journalists is that it's really fascinating for me is that they get addicted to that they know how they know how dangerous that is they've seen many of their colleagues like basically dying and exploding and, and everything and they still have this will to keep doing it for their professionally they think it's important to keep you know reporting and they think it's a mission and but but I think it's it, it goes beyond that I think it's 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 like uh, you live something that's so extraordinary few people uh, uh, only soldiers and but, but few civilians have that feeling of being in the war. It's so extraordinary, so different. And the, the, the way they describe it, it's in this, and they describe it differently. But some, some of them say, oh, time passes differently when you are in a war zone. You can go move really slowly and spend time just looking at the flower or, 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 at the, or the opposite, things moves really fast. Oh, sometimes you want to just have, you just laugh. You just have, a, oh, you, just, you crack a joke. Or it's, it's, it's another state of mind. So when they go back to their ordinary lives, that, those lives, they're not enough anymore. And that's really sad uh, because they kind of need to go back. They, they kind of need that adrenaline or their whatever that, that they feel again. So... Yeah, I read this book that I'm, I'm sorry I forgot the name of the of of the of the journalist that that wrote it, but the, the title of the book was War Junkie, and I think that this is a very accurate uh, way to describe it. Yeah, there's another book we, uh, by a combat zone journalist, and the, and the, the title is My War Is Gone. I miss it so. Oh yeah, I I read that. That's an ama That's one of the best books that I read about it. My War Is Gone, and I miss it. I miss it so. Right. Yeah. And you know, the other part of this is not just the, the you know, depiction of war zone journalists, but the depiction of an America at its own throat. Um, and the last few years have, you know, that's how it's felt, and it's felt on edge. And, the you know, January 6th, you know, seeing an actual insurrection by, attempted insurrection by Americans, 
I, I was wondering about that, Alex, as a, as a as an Englishman showing America in this incredibly divided state where this doesn't feel completely unlikely. Um, uh, I think there's two things I'd say about that. Um, one is that uh, America's state um, and the divisions here are echoed almost precisely in many, many other countries around the world, including mine, many European countries, South American countries like Wagner's, um, Asian countries. I mean, I could list the names, but it would probably be provocative, and uh, we know them anyway. Um, uh, I think that in the case of America, there's, a, there's an extra danger because of America's power and its importance in the world. My, my country does not have the same power and it's not as important in the world. But America really is, everybody looks to America. It gives America a particular focus globally. Um, America has something else as well, which is a sort of internal concept. I think all nations have it, but it's manifested more strongly here because America is more powerful and it's exceptionalism. All, all, all countries do that, all countries think they're exceptional. America has a, its, its brand of American exceptionalism that means it probably feels it's immune from some kinds of problems. So problems might be manifesting everywhere, but concurrent with that is a sense of immunity. And I think that one of the things that history shows again and again and again is nobody is immune. Nobody is exceptional. We're, we're all subject to exactly the same kinds of problems. And if if we don't apply checks and balances and rationality and decency and thoughtfulness to these problems, in any place, it can get out of control. And um, so I'm not trying to locate it to America because that would be factually wrong. Uh, I, I could take you back home and I can show you exactly the same stuff happening in my country. But the implications here are much greater, basically. Can I, can I just add something? I'm, I don't, don't, don't want to go to... Uh, but just to agree with, with Alex, and what the invasion of the capital that happened here in the US, it, ha it, it, it happened exactly in the same way in Brazil. Right? Same thing, right after, right after the election. And I, you, I don't know if you guys know, but Brazil was under a very heavy dictatorship from 64 to 85. So somehow, and when the guys that invaded the, 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 the Brazilian uh, institutions, Brazil was really quick in like sending them to jail and f looking for the people that financed or that, or that, tried, that helped that thing. It's not that Brazilian institutions are stronger, and stronger than America, quite the opposite. We are a younger democracy full of problems and but Brazilians know what an authoritarian regime is. It's really close. It happened like 50 years ago. You know, we know how bad that is, and we don't want that to happen again. And I think, if you allow me to say that, kind of echoing what uh, um, Alex just said, I think Americans take democracy for granted. You know, and. That's a very dangerous uh, thing. And I, I think one of the other elements, though, um, about America is the ubiquity of guns. Um, I have family that lived through the Yugoslavian Civil War, and what they said was that it wasn't the division that brought Yugoslavia to civil war, it was the fact that after you did your national service, everybody got sent home with a gun, just in case they got invaded. So everybody had firepower at home, so when divisions got bad enough, everybody had easy access to guns. And one of the most disturbing parts of the film is every time you see you know, characters, you go, well, are they military, are they civilian? They're all equally easy with a gun. They feel equally happy with it, and you know, being British in America, I still find that deeply disturbing. That it's just like you like you have an M16. Why? Why would? What's what possible reason? And that I think is really fascinating to watch here, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so but I was talking about that about like building this this you know the ease of militarization to this. Um, 
I, uh, I think that's a separate issue. Gun control is a separate issue. I think that the, the way in which a country can disintegrate into civil war can happen whether there are guns floating around the country or not. Some civil wars have been carried out with machetes and still managed to kill a million people. Okay, so it's, it is not actually the gun that is required to make it happen. It might be more efficient in some respects, but it can still happen. So, so I, would, I would separate it from that. I would also say that America has a history of a civil war that was very, very delineated over a very clear issue of slavery. And, and so that creates a concept of civil war in the mind. And it may be a misleading concept for the kinds of risks that exist at the moment that don't have an easy delineation of that sort. And there are other kinds of civil wars which happen a lot in the world at the moment, which are really just a fracturing and a factionalization into competing angry groups in localized areas. And um, the fact that the previous civil war here was fought so clearly should not make one understand one understands or believe one understands all the dangers of civil war because that's what they look like. There is a clear issue in effect and truthfully there is a right and a wrong and lots of other civil wars do not break apart so easily into those kinds of things. And th what really happens with civil wars is neighbors start fighting neighbors. People who knew each other really well start cutting off each other's heads. That's the truth. And you know, this does actually lead to you know, another part of it, which is the scale of the action in this and, and depicting atrocity in this. There are some really grueling scenes in this. And I was, you know, how did you really go balance, try the balance between this is what I want to show because I want to show how horrific this can be and any concerns about going too far and, and being off-putting for the audience? Honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a nuanced question, nuanced answer. Um, and I can't say what is right or wrong. You, you, you give it your best shot. You think about it as hard as you can and you give it your best shot. There's been an argument for a long time about news footage. If a terrible event happens, how much do you show of dead bodies, pieces of bodies? Does that make people refuse to accept the news because they don't want to access those images? or? Worse, does it make them desensitized to those kinds of images? So it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky balance to get right. In this particular case, one of the agendas was, if possible, to make an anti-war movie, something that was emphatically anti-war. I don't know if people will get this reference, but there's an old film called Triumph of the Will, which is essentially a pro-fascist movie, and I, I did not want to accidentally make Triumph of the Will by making a sort of a pro-Civil War movie just by making war seem kind of glamorous and sort of fun, which is mo something movies can do quite easily. And I thought about it very hard, and in the end I thought being unblinking about some of the horrors of war was the correct thing to do. Now, whether I was correct or not in that, that's sort of not for me to judge, but I thought about it hard and came down on that side. But in, in America, the, uh, I'm talking to a lot of journalists, that they said it was the, uh, the road to Basra in the, uh, the first uh, Gulf conflict was there was a point where, and it was when they, you get the well, move into, yeah, into yeah, embedded, right, right, embedded exactly. journalists it, it, exactly. more control. Because this is the thing about journalism, there are some images, say, from the Vietnam War, uh, very famously of an execution of a VC soldier and a young girl who'd been burned by napalm and a, a, a young Buddhist monk who set himself on fire that became reasons why journalism suddenly did have an effect and changed the public mood. So... Uh, actually, that's partly why photojournalists are at the heart of this. Often, modern journalism of that sort is videoed rather than stills. But I, you know, I was trying to do that throwback thing. Um, journalism can be fantastically powerful, provided that it's being listened to. And one of the really interesting things about the state that your country is in, and my country is in, and many of the others, the debates. In a way, the journalists are doing their job, right? The, the debates are all out there. The warnings are all out there. Everybody is aware of the warnings on both sides, all sides of the political divide. But for some reason, they don't get any traction. And, and where is the lack of traction? Why are the wheels spinning in the mud? And I, I thought to myself, is it the polarization? Is it just that we're not able to absorb 
information because of the, the position we already hold. Hence, taking a movie which pulls the polarization out of it, refuses to engage in that and tries to find points of agreement uh, which are, are depoliticized for a political reason. Just a reminder, we will be taking questions, so do make sure to submit them via the South West, uh, South West Go app. Um, you know, part of it, the other part of this is that this is, I think in some ways this is the biggest film you've made. And we discussed biggest, this. Most expensive. Most expensive, yeah. but also the, with the, the biggest, with the largest set pieces. You could say it's the one that lost the most amount of money. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you're going with biggest, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. But, you know, the, the, the sheer scale of shooting on this and navigating um, you know, the cast within it, creating choreog yeah, the choreography of that. And one of the things I found interesting throughout is that you do spend a lot, of, there's quite a few shots where it's very important that there's, you've got a, something happening in the background, but the, the other cast members are, are doing something in the background and you do play with depth of field. So, you know, when Joel is flirting with the shop, uh, shopkeeper and there's a moment where Stephen is, is in the background keeping an eye on Jesse and these creating that choreography and, and creating this depth within these within these scenes. I was, you know, the constructing of that and the the basic idea of that to have kind of scenes behind scenes that are still building character. Is that me again? All right, well, I, I'm going to throw it over there because uh, there are different ways of directing. I, I do not shot list, I do not pre-block. Um, we do two weeks of rehearsals before to talk through motivations and scenes and characters. I never arrive with a shot list. I rehearse with the actors and I see what they want to do. And, and then Rob Hardy, the DOP, and I figure out how we're going to shoot it. Um, because if I've planned a shot with someone standing by a window and they don't want to stand by the window, uh, what am I going to do? Force them over there to get them backlit? It just doesn't seem right for the, for the action and for the drama, really. So the things you're talking about are, in a way, orchestrated by them. And then Rob and I are trying to figure out how to shoot it. So the micro dramas, the little beats you're seeing in the background, are part of how the cast have inhabited the space, I would say. But that comes from you trusting your actors and letting us sort of lead. That you know, we, we get onto the set and you just, okay, what's your instinct? That's not every movie. You know, sometimes it's the other way around. And um, I think that's because you prioritize character uh, or you, you, you put a lot into that. And, and that's really useful for us. But also there was like really cool shots of us through the mirror in that, because I'm thinking about the shop. Yeah. And there was some play of me and you in the mirror. And that was semi, we figured that out and orchestrated that. You can't say that, you know. No, but, but, but you... <laughs> I mean, you do plan some beautiful things. No, no uh, it, it's, it, it's slightly different. What happens is I've never found that once actors have blocked a scene, you can't then find a cool way to shoot it. Yes, so, yes, so I, yes. You, and also, by the way, production designers, they always chuck a mirror in somewhere. Right, that, that, <laughs> because because they know how this works, and then yeah. and then me and Rob go. Oh, look, look, Ooh, if you, the camera's over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I felt a little. Well, we did always go first. It was it was like whatever yes, we felt. Did. Yes, I yes. never felt like I was like, why am I oh, standing here? Oh no, like I have here? to stand here. No, I didn't feel that. I, I didn't feel that way either. Mm -hmm. Okay, going to uh, take some of the audience questions now. Um, start off with this from anonymous. Uh, for Kirsten and Kaylee, um, there's a lot of work with analog cameras. How was it using those cameras in the film, and did you already know how to use them? I didn't. I didn't know how to use cameras. No. I, I just used my phone. I mean, to be honest, I had, I had my child, my second child turned one on this film. So, like, I still was, you know, a new second mom. And, um, yes, I was not taking, I wasn't carrying around a digital camera everywhere I went. And then I started to, and it was kind of COVID still, and my husband was working in Austin at the time, so I would just take photos of my children running around the house pretty much or like go for a walk and just have my camera on me at all times. But yeah, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't familiar with the camera I used. Trying to take photos of small children running around, very similar to uh, the carnage of a war zone. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> no, I just had to get used to using the camera. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. I mean, th that's when you get a character, you have a sort of in you know, Jessie's in was her love for 
uh, photography and photojournalism and um, particularly using film. Um, so that that's always a real treat when I'm trying to sort of crack the code on who the person I'm playing is and you know got to do sort of fun nerdy stuff. Uh, Alex is a great photographer so I referred to him and got to play in the dark room a bit and um, uh, yeah it, it was a good time and then you know doing research on you know Lee Miller and Don McCullen and Lindsay Adario and just sort of but th that that's our first step in and the fact that she's I, using film is kind of, you know, speaks to her I, romance with, with you know, these old school yeah. war zone journalists of like, and showing off like, oh, I, I still use, use actual celluloid. There's something yeah. wonderful about that. Yeah. I, I shot with, with film the whole entire time. I don't know if any of them ended up yeah, getting yeah. used. Yeah, we did. Oh, yeah. thanks. Cool. Um, <laughs> but then that ending uh, it sounds like I'm, I'm bragging bragging about myself. Brag away. <laughs> no, but the ending, it was just a, fu it was a fun thing to get to do. The ending, the ending shots in DC, all the photos that Jesse is taking. Um, Dave, our camera operator, was taking those shots, but I got to sort of take the lead to compose the shots before and sort of tell Dave, oh, this is the photo I want to grab here. This yeah. is what I'm seeing here. And that was just, it was, it was cool to get no, to all, take them. All of those photos are your photos and we, we have them as developed film, but they're very blurry and sort of yes. <laughs> <laughs> No, That's no, they're very blurry because it was really dark and on a slow shutter speed, it's going to be blurry. Thank you. It's going to be blurry. Well, but the idea was there. They, they, they were beautifully framed and that's what Thank matters. Thank you. <laughs> well, with only we're one in best. 30 to keep her anyway, so. But that is actually true. So, Alex, uh, do you see or intend there to be a thematic through line about systems collapsing uh, in, your, uh, in your filmography? Hmm. <laughs> or are you just British and bleak? Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't intend it, but it is definitely there. I can see it's there. Um, uh, it, it comes from a sense of anxiety. And, it's, no, I think, and I think that's a really fair question. When I look at devs... Uh, say a TV show, probably almost nobody's watched it, but it, it, it is a show about anxiety of tech leaders who are presented as geniuses but are actually entrepreneurs and, and the danger of what that does and the systems that collapse under that. Um, they're, they're, yeah, they're social systems, they're often ethical systems of uh, collapse. Um, in this particular case... Um, uh, it, it's a collapse that is manifested. It's just a, it's just around us. It's as I said. There's no secret here. There's none. Ev everybody can see it, and everybody worries about it within reason. Um, but it, it, it's not like I set out to do that. It's just a reflection of what's freaking me out at the time. And um, this one for Kaylee. Um, do you have a different mindset when you're portraying a real life character like Priscilla versus a fictional character like Jesse? Uh, yes. Um, let's see if I can f find something uh, intelligent to say on that. <coughs> I, I think um, playing a real-life character, you almost have too much information. You know, playing Priscilla, I, was, I had, I had the real-life woman who would experience it. I had books and so, much, so many resources, so you're just trying to figure out how you can sort of uh, zone in on a couple of specific things and uh, make something my own and try to get as much information into a film as possible. And with this, you're you're just trying to gather as much inf information as you can. It, uh, pff, I, pff, that was... <laughs> I don't know. I don't, yeah, different, mi yeah, different mindsets. I, I, the, the, I just sounded like the same thing. I don't know. I try my best. I just... Yeah, anyways, uh, moving on. Kirsten. Yes. <laughs> Kirsten. <laughs> so what made you want to work with Alex and what was unique about his process compared to, compared to uh, others you've worked with and other major directors you've worked with? I've been a fan of Alex's, obviously. Well, since I saw Ex Machina. But, um, yeah, I, I wrote, you, you make so few movies and I was actually jealous seeing posters with other actresses thinking, God damn it, they're lucky. I really want to work with Alex Garland. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I would have done any film with Alex, really. So I didn't... I'm someone who's very director-driven, though. Like, 
you could have me in a room with a chicken if you're a good director, and I'd be <laughs> fine with that. You know, it, it doesn't really matter. You know, I, I don't really care about... It's, I'm not driven by script. I'm driven by directors, and he's such an, like... In, very, I felt like very honest and trusted and respected, and I just felt like we were a team, all of us. And we were all very much heard and very honest with each other. Yeah, Alex is a straight shooter, which I really <laughs> appreciate. <laughs> and it's also, you know, I mean, Alex, you're known in a lot of ways for your dialogue, but, you know, particularly Lee is a very... There's a lot of space there, I think, for an actress. And I think that, again, that speaks to the degree of, of trust that has to be there, that you're going to find those moments within the script and those tiny little bits, because she's, you know, she's taciturn. She's broken. She's, you know, everything she says is either um, a warning or a dismissal to a certain degree. Um, uh, I, I had this idea with... Lee, which is she always just speaks the truth. She sort of speaks like she photographs. So any statement she makes might be blunt, but it has a sort of... I'm a little bit you. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I but copied I'm, I'm the way more you broken, did things. I think. <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, so there was something like that. But I also... I, uh, w one of the first lessons I learned, because I came from novel writing where you fill in all the gaps then became a filmmaker. And I, I realised very, very quickly that the more gaps I leave, the better, I in a sense. The more space I give for a, an actor, but also a DOP or a production designer or wh whoever it happens to be, um, giving as much autonomy, being as anti auteurism as possible, in a sense, um, uh, that the film gets elevated because they bring themselves and their ideas and it, almost inevitably there'll be things I haven't thought of. Um, and, and then also extend that to the audience. Um, uh, I think gaps are a good thing. It allows people to occupy that space if they want to. Um, uh, so, but but with Lee specifically, it was that it was words like photos. Um, yeah, I just got. Who's J or Mackendorf? Hello, sorry. It's just your questions down there. You say, can you talk about the halo lens effect that shows up in Lee's vision but transfers to Jesse? I I just want to say. You're one of two people who've, who've noticed that, <laughs> including everyone in the crew. <laughs> um, okay, who is the other one? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, it, it's, um, it's very subtle. Uh, it, and, and actually, it's good, because it allows me to talk about anti auteurism That was an idea by the colour grader. And it was, it was using something within the image to talk about the transference that happens between Lee and Jesse and, and this, this visual state that Lee exists in transfers. Then Nobody fucking saw that. that it's, it's, <laughs> I, it's very subtle, but I love it. And I'm, I'm uh, very glad you uh, spotted it. So thanks. That, that, anyway, that's why it's there. Cool. Oh, well, that's why you spotted it. Cool. Well, it, I'll tell Asa, the colorist, he will be delighted. Because <laughs> I, I, I did, I turned up into the grade and he said, hey, look at this. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, I think this one's uh, for Alex. It's like, uh, uh, ooh, things are uh, flipping around. Uh, did you consult with academics or politicians who study and write about the potential for civil war in the US uh, or, or what resources did you draw on apart from you know, reading the paper every day? Um, uh, no, I didn't. Um, I have been to a couple of countries in a state of civil war. So I suppose in some ways I'm drawing on that and the anxiety of that maybe. Um, uh, but I think I'll just go back to what I was saying before. I don't think there's any original idea contained in this because this has been part of a large conversation. It's not, it's not the fact that the conversation exists. It does or doesn't exist. It's the fact that it exists, but it doesn't have traction. It, it's the, so I'm trying to think, how how can one have it gain traction? It needs to gain traction in order for some kind of uh, regression to be arrested. Um, and, and then just trying to participate in that conversation. 
Um, why, why are we talking but not listening? Is it, wh wh where's the failure? Why do we not trust? We've lost trust with the media and we've lost trust with politicians. And some media are wonderful and some politicians are wonderful. Some of them are ideologically sound and decent on both sides of the divide. Why are we not listening to them? What, what like, uh, I have a political position. I have good friends on the other side of that political divide. Honestly, not trying to be cute, what's so hard about that? What, why, why are we shutting this down? Le left and right, just to be clear about it, are ideological arguments about how to run a state. That's all they are. They're not a right or wrong in terms of good and bad. The right or wrong is which one do you think has greater efficacy? That's it. And then if you try one and it doesn't work out, you vote it out and you try again with a different way. That, that's the process. Um, but we've made it into good and bad. Uh, it's become a, a, a moral issue. That's fucking idiotic and it's incredibly dangerous. Um, so, yeah. Well, I think that's very true. I mean, you know, I, some of the strongest warnings I heard coming in from the rise of the ultra right were about Repu were coming from Republicans who were saying this is coming and this is on uh, this is on our side of the fence and you need to know this is coming. And I think you know if people had listened to some of them earlier, we may not be in quite the position we're in now. And that's that's the terrifying thing that we have become so bunkerized. How do you see that changing? Uh, on this shoot, I was working with lots of different kinds of people and there were people on all political positions and all of them got the film and supported it and worked really hard and we got on really well and had beers and just sort of enjoyed each other's company and respected each other. Um, I personally, personally, I attach some of this to social media. I think that there is a... Uh, an interaction that exists human to human that somehow there is a something dissonant happens and it floats away when it reaches a public forum. And actually this is exactly like the other thing. I think we all know that. I'm not making an insightful observation. Everybody is aware of that. Everybody's aware that the frenzy up here does not really speak for them. If if it really did speak for them, okay, that might be one of the crazies. But but Broadly, amongst all people, 99.9% .9 of people I interact with, it's not like that. So, so it's something to do with the way voices are amplified. It's something to do with the way voices are disseminated. And it's also to do with fear. Um, it's to do with politicians being afraid of their electorate because their electorate no longer trusts them. And media organizations being af afraid of their viewership or their readership because they don't want to lose them and they don't want to lose advertising revenue. And that is taking them away from the important part of their job, which, to, which is to be trusted, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and I'll, I think we'll wrap up with this uh, last question from uh, Ben Weaver. Uh, the film wrestles with passing down complicated professions and traditions. As filmmakers and actors, does this idea resonate uh, while being in the film industry? Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just reading it. Um. I mean, yes. for us, I think that was something like that we, we really were drawing on. Yeah, and I think that's with... with you know, yeah, it does in any any industry where there's a mentor and a mentee, like you know, any anyone who has more knowledge than you, and you know, you yeah, yeah, it's yes. like yeah, it's like us. <laughs> <laughs> and especially because it does seem that the industry is changing so fast, but there are still some constants that I think do need to be handed down. It's like, you know, when I have interns at my paper, like, the stuff you teach them is the basics that don't seem to ever, ever shift. But there's something, you know, Kelly, was there anything you really took away from working with Wagner and uh, Kirsten? Wow, so much. <laughs> 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 uh, um, yeah, I, 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 I mean, the, those parallels were, were there and that unspoken thing that we talked about earlier between Jesse and Lee, that we also share that unspoken thing as Kaylee and Kirsten. Yeah. There, there are things that are, 
um, yeah, yeah that, it, that, that only Kirsten could understand and things that are ahead of me or things that I've already experienced, so yes. Can I just add something like it, it was this was one of the nicest experiences that I had with the cast. You know, we were like I think like I don't know like seventy percent of the film in a car, like just the four of us could have been a bad experience. <laughs> and it was absolutely wonderful. I mean, I I I honestly love Kirsten and Kaylee. And I want to talk specifically about Stephen McKillen Henderson, who is talking about the passing of, uh, like, I have so much respect for, for the actors that opened spaces for other actors. You know, like, like, and, and Stephen, like, even like for him, him being, being a black actor, you know, that I guess like when he started, things were way more complicated, way harder for him. And he's such a master Jedi <laughs> in terms of being calm and nice and friendly. And he, te he taught me so much without really telling me anything, but just by the way he behaves on a set. And, and I, I just want to say here, and I think I talk up with all of us as we have the same opinion about that guy is one, one of the best people I, I've met in this industry and he's just amazing. I can't wait to see him. He's going to be in LA. LA yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, you, Alex. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you, Wagner. Thank you to A24 for uh, showing the film.